Hello. Today I want to talk to you about the current climate of law enforcement in this country. Uh, it's, it's really disheartening. And I thought that I would take an opportunity to speak to you about my feelings on the topic. You can see that on my badge I'm wearing what we call a mourning band. And that mourning band is worn by all law enforcement officers when an officer is killed in the line of duty in the state of California. This year alone, six weeks into the year, nationwide, there has already been 18 law enforcement officers that have died in the line of duty, one third of them by gunfire. In my 37 years in law enforcement, I've never seen such a lack of respect for our profession and such violent attacks on our officers. More officers are being shot and killed than ever before. This past Monday, we lost another officer in California. Officer Keith Boyer of the Whittier Police Department was shot and killed after he and his partner were investigating a traffic collision in the city of Whittier. And many of you may have seen the conference, press conference on television where their chief, Jeff Piper, stated, we need to wake up. Enough is enough. You're passing these propositions and you're creating these laws that are raising the crime rates in the state of California. What Chief Piper was referring to was Assembly Bill 109, Proposition 47, and Proposition 57, and to some extent, the recent Proposition 64. You need to take a moment and you need to look up and educate yourself on what these propositions were and how they impact community safety. We know that these propositions are a result of the voting public and that AB 109 was passed by the state legislature who were also voted into office by the voting public. Every state association representing law enforcement, the chiefs, the sheriffs, police officers, the district attorneys association opposed this legislation and these propositions. We knew what was going to happen if they passed. AB 109 was signed by the governor in 2011 after the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that California prisons were overcrowded. AB 109 moved certain felony offenders back into the county jail system. As a result, thousands of criminals were released back into our local communities. Prop 47 stopped some nonviolent criminals from going into prison. It also reduced certain felony crimes to misdemeanors. The goal of the initiative was to fund additional substance abuse and mental health services with the savings from housing incarcerations, from lowering incarcerations. We have not seen this come to fruition yet. Since the passing of these propositions, the increase in property crime in California is the largest year after year increase since the 1960s. The increase in violent crime is the largest year after year increase since the 1990s. As a result, what we are seeing are repeat offenders committing multiple crimes because they know that there are no consequences and that they will not be held accountable. There are no consequences for these crimes any longer. It's a revolving door for these criminals and they know it. The suspect that shot and killed Whittier police officer Boyer was a parolee who had just been recently released from prison for armed robbery. Since being released from prison in April of 2016, he violated his parole five times by committing a number of additional criminal offenses. He served what is known as flash incarcerations. In a flash incarceration, an offender serves a 10-day jail sentence in county jail for a parole violation instead of being sent back to prison as was in the past. Flash incarcerations were authorized under AB 109, which was signed into law by Governor Jerry Brown in 2011. This needs to stop. I am asking you to educate yourself and make sure that you understand what you're voting for. The senseless killing of law enforcement officers cannot continue. We, and I emphasize we, 
need to make sure that those that commit crimes are held more accountable for their actions. I want you to know that I truly appreciate all of the support I get from the Buena Park community. And I just want to thank you for your time. Hello and welcome to Crime Watch. I'm Jane Cameron with Surgeon Mike Lovecheck at the wheel. Now, as you may have noticed, there are no borders around cities. Yet I can't believe that crime stays just in the city. So there's got to be a way to get around that madness. Well, you know, yeah, you're right. Sometimes you think to yourself, you wish there would be like some some big rubber wall around the city where they, if somebody tries to run in and, and wants to commit crimes, they bounce off and they can't get into here. Or keep them out or if they want out. to come in. Exactly. But uh, the way to get around that, obviously, yeah, you're right. There's no, there's no uh, borders when it comes down to you know where, where crime happens and what have you. And a lot of times what will happen is uh, we'll get a call from another agency that's asking us to assist them in a particular crime that they're investigating or suspicious circumstances that they're investigating and need to get a little bit more information. Now, does is there anything that stops those officers from coming into another city? Oh no, they can uh, they they can come over here, and we as well as we can go over to um, other agencies or other cities. It's not like uh, you know, like you said, the borders don't aren't there. We can't. It's not that we can't go into it. But the the depending on what you're doing or what you're going over there for if it's something just for a quick follow-up it's not that big of a deal but if you're going to go catch a you know a, a heinous criminal uh, you need to have proper backup and proper uh, equipment that you're going to need for for whatever purpose you're there for but the big thing is uh, is that you notify the other agency of what you're doing if you have business in another another city because police officers can look suspicious well no <laughs> Uh, here's the reason why I, I say that they have to do it is because let's say I'm, I'm a field supervisor okay and then all of a sudden um, we hear on, a, on a, a frequency or we're getting a call of an officer needs assistance and we have no, let's say they're at the you know the, the corner in our, on San Jerome right here where we're going past right now we have no idea what they're doing here what's going on who who are you who are these people that uh, that are in our city who are these cops that are in our city so it's just good to have a heads up to know that, yeah, we're going to be at San Jaron and, and Holder on a follow-up. And then when, if, when and if they do need help, we know who they are, what they're doing, and where we need to go. We've heard on the radio sometimes that there are warrant searches by other agencies. That's the same sort of idea, right? Exactly. Well, there's a, a couple of different types of warrants that, that could be served here. You could have search warrants or you could have arrest warrants or a combination of both. And so what happens is, let's say for example, and they, an agency uh, is investigating some sort of a crime that, that leads them to a house in Buena Park, another agency. Uh, they may get a search warrant to search that particular house. And then it's their search, it's their, it's their operation. Um, or let's say for example, they're investigating a crime and the bad guy lives in Buena Park. Uh, so they may have an arrest warrant for that particular person. So if he lives at you know this house right here, they'll come and, and serve those search or those types of warrants here at the, in our city. Now, I know that Buena Park Police Department trains their officers. Every department has a training unit. Do are they all trained on the same things so that 
you have an understanding when you're at a scene that there's a, a way to operate? Every city does things differently. Uh, I will say that, that we have a protocol that we follow that is, uh, may not necessarily be what the protocol of an Anaheim or a, uh, of a, or a La Palma or something like that or LAPD. But generally speaking, tactic-wise, yeah, those are all those are all the same. You know, officer safety is paramount no matter what we what we do. But like as far as you know, how we put our shotguns in our car or something like that or whatever it is, that's that that can be entirely uh, by each each by each by city. It's great though to think that everybody works together. Yeah, exactly. Hi guys. <laughs> scene of something that's actually not that unusual, a minor traffic accident, right? right. Uh, we were at Commonwealth and uh, our Auto Center and we came here to assist the officers on a non-injury traffic accident or a minor injury traffic accident and fire department was here already, they did their thing and they didn't want to go to the hospital or any of that so right now what we're doing is we're watching the officer take the report. Now what's interesting and what you don't see is another person that's off camera part of the police department, not dressed like a police officer at all, kind of undercover-like, and yet he's supposed to be here. So what else is going on? Well, the officer who is taking the report, who's, ha who's handling this call, is uh, Officer Lowe, and you might be able to see him down the way. Way the down there. there. Yes. <laughs> he's actually taking the report, but he is just completing his field training phases right now, and he's uh, this is his very last phase which we call a ghost ride, which means that his training officer is watching, but he basically doesn't, he basically doesn't <laughs> exist. Uh, this is entirely Officer Lowe's call and he's handling it start to finish. Now, does this uh, officer not talk to him at all during the course of the shift? They'll have conversations. It's not like he's just going to sit there and do nothing, but they'll, they'll certainly have conversations. But when it comes time to do work, when it comes time to, to go out and, and, and do police work, he's on his own. Matter of fact, it's, uh, it, he'll, he'll stay back in the shadows and just kind of watch. Now, obviously, if something happens to where you know, he needs to intervene, he, he, can, he can do so. So that's not a, not a problem with that at all. But again, it's just one of those things where it's like, you know, a lot of times we're on our own out here and we're handling stuff like this and you gotta be able to know what you're doing. It must be kind of unsettling, you know, that this officer has been with a, a trainer for X amount of weeks and now all of a sudden you're on your own. It's like cutting the umbilical cord <laughs> or it's like getting pushed out of the nest. You got to start flapping your arms, otherwise you're not going to fly. Uh, and how long does this officer do this? Well, he's, uh, I, I want to say it's about a week's worth of uh, ghost riding. So he'll probably ride a whole week, so probably four nights uh, like this. And then once he's done with his ghost rides, he'll get put on a shift on his on his own. Really, really, this time. So. Where there won't even be the ghost officer yeah. with him. <laughs> but again, we, we do a real good job of backing each other up. Uh, like, for example, on this particular call, uh, we would have had a, a second officer here anyway. I put myself out on the call so they know that he's here. And it's just general safety stuff like that. You don't really want cops doing stuff by themselves, per se. But... Uh, but again, but there are going to be times though when you know if the, if everything else is is going crazy around here and this is the the only call that's pending, he may have to handle it by himself. Hmm. So we've got this officer coming out of training. We've got several officers that are in the academy, right? A bunch of new officers, of new officers. more gray hair. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, you know, actually, we may not be able to talk to him tonight, but I'm sure we'll catch him one of these days when we're able to get a good interview out of him. A big event that a lot of police departments had, nationally, internationally even, was the Baker to Vegas run. So what is the Baker to Vegas run? 
Well, it's been around for a number of years. It was uh, started by LAPD a number of years ago, I think back in the 1980s. And uh, basically what it is, it's a uh, about a 120 mile long foot race uh, between the city of Baker and the city of Las Vegas. Uh, and it's uh, participated about, uh, in with, uh, I think nowadays, about 270 uh, teams that are able to go in from various police departments. It's from uh, all over the nation, basically. And I think there's some from Canada as well, too. Uh, it's a it's a great great uh, project that they've have uh, and like I said they've been doing it for a number of years. Um, a lot of it has to, that people were saying, well, why are they doing it and what have you? As well, you know what? It's a great way to promote teamwork, uh, physical fitness, uh, camaraderie amongst the people, and competition. So it's a it's a it's a great great uh, venue. Officer Perez, what was the uh, amount of time that you had to uh, run? Uh, it was uh, six and a half miles. It was uh, all incline at about an eight percent incline the whole time up. And my run was around 9.30 p.m. at night. So were you training for this ahead of time? Yeah. Myself and Officer Johnson were training about two, three months prior. We would go to the gym before our graveyard shifts. Okay, so the big question, why? Not because it's there. It, it's a lot of fun going out there and being a it's camaraderie with the teamwork. You get to meet other departments. I mean, there's departments from Canada, there's departments from New York. There's pretty much departments from all over the country coming out there, and you get to meet meet those other departments and hang out with them. And so it's, it's big camaraderie, big teamwork. It is a big deal for the Buena Park Police Department to be involved. Absolutely, man. In fact, we've been participating in it for a number of years. Um, we it's it's hard to compete with the the teams that have LAPD, yeah. LA Sheriff. I'm not going to say that they have San Diego Police. I'm not going to say that they have ringers on the team. <laughs> However, they're laughing. <laughs> I will say though that these guys. I mean, look look at the, these guys are are studs. So we we have our own uh, ringers as well too. And it's something that the department supports. Right, absolutely. Matter of fact, um, I want to say there's probably at least, what, how many runners do we have total? Do you remember? 20, and then I believe four alternates. Yeah, yeah tw so 24 runners, and then uh, at least a dozen or so support uh, people that come along and they drive the cars and they drive the runners to where they need to be at and stuff like that. So uh, there's a, it's, a, it's a big uh, operation, a big uh, organization uh, for, for somebody to put together. And, there, and it's, like I said, they've been doing it for a number of years. So are you committing to do it next year too? This was my second time doing it. I might do it a third. I haven't really decided yet. It really <laughs> comes down to the training. Uh, okay, you're newer, so you're going to, right? It's my second time and absolutely I'll be there. That's a great event. It is. Well, definitely worthwhile and a lot of fun. Well, if you have any questions about tonight's show, you can call the Buena Park Police Department at 562-3901. They're on Instagram. They're on Twitter. They're on Facebook. They're in their backyard. No, actually. <laughs> but they're everywhere. So there's a lot of good information that comes out. I love the graphics of the traffic accident and the little map. But it's very cool knowing that the Buena Park Police Department is there trying to make sure your community is safe. So with Sergeant Mike Levchik, I'm Jane Cameron. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like us on the official City of Buena Park Facebook page and follow us on Twitter. There you'll find a little of everything from information about our city services and upcoming events to discounts offered by our entertainment attractions such as Knott's Berry Farm, Medieval Times, and Pirate's Dinner Adventure.